<clears throat> so again, I'm happy to be here and um, I do want to encourage everyone to put questions in the chat box as we go along. I may or may not see them as we go, but Lizzie will be tracking them. And if I don't get to them during the talk, we should have time at the end to address those. So definitely use that. And I am going to bring up a slideshow and talk through some slides about posture and hypermobility. And so let me do that now and we'll get going. Okie doke, um, here we are, what is good posture and why does it matter for people with hypermobility? Okay, well, this is an interesting topic, I think, and sounds like you think it is too. And so what we're gonna do during the next little bit is we're gonna talk about this concept of posture, what is it? And we gotta talk about what is hypermobility. So we are gonna sort of introduce posture and then take a little detour into hypermobility and hypermobility syndromes. Then we'll come back and say, well, does posture matter for bendy people and why? And then, you know, one of the things that can be lingering in the minds of all you yoga teachers is how should we cue posture? Like, what should I say about it? And that type of thing. So that may come up in some discussion as we get towards the end of things today. So what is posture? Well, posture is essentially how we arrange our parts in gravity. That's all that is. So what posture is? It's like, um, you know, it generally refers to kind of static positions where we're either sitting or standing for some amount of time. Um, we don't really talk about posture when, we, when we're moving. Um, so we're, we're looking at more static positions and sometimes people talk about posture with some aesthetic values in place. Sometimes there may be a functional value of how we want to arrange our parts for a certain reason. And sometimes there's simply a comfort value. And so I think in our, uh, general notions about posture, certainly that, you know, many of us were raised with, and many of us were raised in yoga with have more to do with aesthetics than function. So we're going to hopefully get into a discussion about what's functionally useful about stacking our parts in a certain way versus in other ways. That's ultimately the question that I'm interested in. You know, um, so that's kind of what we're going to look at. Okie doke. And what is good posture? If posture is how we stack our parts and gravity, well, what does it mean to have good posture? Well, it 100% of the time depends on who you ask. <laughs> you know, if you ask, well, if I were to go back in time and, you know, ask my teachers or something in elementary school, they'd probably have a certain thing to say about it and, and so on. But generally people are including an emphasis on, okay, what's your pelvis doing? What's your rib cage doing? What are your ears and shoulders doing? And how are they related to the rest of your body? And very often it just comes down to not slouching. You know, a lot of people, if you ask what is good posture, they'll just say it's not slouching. Um, and so we can really unpack that a little bit to, to ask, well, why is slouching just unappealing for us to look at? Or does it lead to some real issues? And if so, for whom? Those are the questions. So. Um, here's a, a friend here who's kind of slouching in this picture, and now she's more upright. And it's more aesthetically pleasing, certainly, when we see someone who's holding their body up in gravity in a more robust way versus in a collapsed way. Whether that is linked to how they feel, like their musculoskeletal status and pain level, that's a much more complicated question. And that is when the question really is, well, whose posture are we talking about? Okay. So, you know, does posture matter? Well, I have to say that there's a bunch of current research out there in the world that really does call into question how much the specifics of our posture really contribute to um, all of our troubles for the general population. And, you know, with things like low back pain and neck and shoulder pain, there, there's a lot of research that, while not perfect, I mean, these research studies are all limited and it's, it's really hard to control for all the variables that might be uh, impacting how we feel. 
Absolutely. But it's interesting to note that there are several studies out there that kind of call into question this idea that we can blame everything on poor posture. We really can't. OK, however, posture becomes more significantly important in my mind when we're talking about people with hypermobility. And there are a few reasons for that. So what I want to do now is uh, get into, well, what is hypermobility? What are some of the features of people who have hypermobility? And then we can kind of say, OK, given that, it makes sense for us to be mindful about how we stack our parts in gravity. OK, so let's get into a little bit um, of that and what's what's up with being um, bendy is what I call it having hypermobility. Okay, hypermobility is just a word that is descriptive, and what it describes is a joint's ability to move more than is considered normal or typical for a human being. Okay, it's just it's not a pathology in and of itself to have hypermobility. It's just a descriptor. And if you have five or more joints that move more than is normal, that's considered generalized hypermobility. Um, but some people have hypermobility and they don't have any symptoms. They're they're actually fine. <laughs> we don't need to, and we don't ever really need to flip out when we see someone with, you know, we suspect has joint hypermobility. But it does clue us into okay, there may be some interesting things going on here, and they may be having some interesting um, experiences living in this bendy body. So let's look at what causes hypermobility. And the thing is, several factors can contribute to someone's display of more than normal range of motion. All right, some of those contributing factors would include the shape of your bones, the way they come together at joints, the shape of the joint socket, and what kind of and how much movement that allows, the muscle tone, um, whether your muscles are chronically contracting or able to relax really easily, you know, what's their uh, flexibility, that's under the control of the nervous system, that muscle tone, that will contribute to how much movement we're able to do. But we're going to be talking more about what's going on at the joints, thanks to the connective tissue that surrounds them. Connective tissue, um, especially that's made largely of collagen. So I'll call that collagenous connective tissue. That's things like tendons and ligaments and joint capsules and fascia. All right, when we have um, a genetic difference in our connective tissue laxity, so everyone has a certain amount of laxity in their connective tissue. I'll just back up a second. For some of us, our, our connective tissue is more floppy, it's more lax, that means it yields more, it sort of spreads out more easily, it's, it's not as taut. And that's because there's actually a genetic difference in the collagen fibers that make up that connective tissue. Collagen is a special thing, it's everywhere in the body, and it makes up a lot of different, it's part of a lot of different tissues, right? Not just these collagenous connective tissues, but also it's part of your bones, it's part of your gut lining and your blood vessels, it's just everywhere. And um, some people have a difference in the uh, either the production or the function of structure or function of collagen fibers that leads to tissues being more lax. And um, I call that floppiness, floppy connective tissues, just because that's what my brain does with terms. It makes them, tries to make them less technical. So I, I like to think of it as floppiness. And what that means is we have decreased stability from those structures passive support structures. That's what, you know, ligaments and fascia and joint capsules, we could consider all those things kind of passive supports, uh, meaning we don't have to contract them. They're just there and holding us together. Collagen literally is considered the glue that is holding your body together. So when we have lax collagen throughout our body, we have less stability from those passive structures. And that gets us into a realm where we're more likely to have symptoms associated with our hypermobility. All right, a lot of different musculoskeletal symptoms, but also just wide ranging multi-system comorbidities, which is just fancy word for like co-occurring conditions, okay? So it sort of leads to a big ball, a big tangled ball of yarn is how I describe hypermobility syndromes. Um, but the what underlies it is this genetic difference in collagen structure 
and or function or the function of the cells that create collagen, right? Something in that really complicated um, physiology of collagen is different in this person who has hypermobility oftentimes, especially symptomatic hypermobility. So let's talk for a moment about some of the most common hypermobility syndromes. When you see the word hypermobility syndrome, that's just a clue that now we're talking about symptomatic hypermobility, okay? And there are a lot of different conditions which have hypermobility as a feature. I'm gonna talk about the two most common ones, which is hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and hypermobility spectrum disorder. These are just big words, but once you kind of start using them and understand them, they're, they're a little bit less uh, off-putting, hopefully. Um, so let's talk first about the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Now, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is actually, there are 14 of them, 14 subtypes, okay? And this is a genetic connective tissue disorder. And of the 14 types, many most of them are rare conditions or even ultra rare. All right, and all of them except one has a clear genetic molecular marker, meaning I could have a blood test and they could look at things in my blood to determine whether I have 13 types of these of Ehlers-Danlos. The one type that doesn't have that yet is called hypermobile type, and it's the most common type, and that's a bummer. <laughs> that's the type I have. And um you know, the prevalence of hypermobile EDS is difficult to really pin down because it's so poorly diagnosed and poorly understood in the medical world. And I hope that that changes over time and quickly because I, I do think a lot of people have it. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I just was diagnosed a few years ago and really um, quite changed my life finally getting that understanding about my unique body. So anyway, there are 14 types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, hypermobile type being the most common, but being the only one that really isn't well understood yet from a genetic perspective, what's the underlying cause of that. So it is diagnosed not by a blood test, but instead by a clinical checklist, which is available online. I'm happy to point you to it later if you'd like. And it's just, you know, you check the boxes if you have all these different signs and symptoms. Now, plenty of people out there have symptomatic hypermobility and they have overlapping and very similar symptoms to that of hypermobile EDS, but they don't check all the boxes. And so those people are often given this broader um, definition or broader um, diagnosis, I should say, of hypermobility spectrum disorder. And that is symptomatic hypermobility that doesn't meet the criteria for EDS and also doesn't meet the criteria for any of the other um, genetic connective tissue disorders that we know of. But here's what I want to just really emphasize for you listeners in case some of you out there have symptomatic hypermobility or trying to understand that for yourself, is that hypermobility spectrum disorder is not a lesser diagnosis. It's not like, um, you know, qualitatively less severe than EDS. It may be even more severe. It's just simply doesn't meet those diagnostic criteria. Um, so that can be confusing for people. It can also be confusing for your doctor. So they may not actually know that too. Okay. So taken together, this is like the biggest pile of people who have symptomatic hypermobility, people with hypermobile EDS and hypermobility spectrum disorder, okay? That's the biggest pile of bendy people who have symptoms associated with it. And what are those symptoms? Well, um, we're not going to go into all of them today. We're only going to go into like one or two that are really related to posture, but they are wide ranging um, and across many, many systems of the body. We'll get a, a long list potentially of uh, musculoskeletal complaints, of mental health issues, of autonomic nervous system dysfunction, immune system and digestive system issues. So you can read all about those in my book and elsewhere as well. But, um, but those are common, just a whole cluster. But most relevant for our discussion about posture today is we're going to talk about muscle pain and muscle fatigue 
in people with hypermobility. And we'll also talk a little bit about dysautonomia, or um, and that's a fancy word for autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Okay, so we'll kind of get into those two aspects of some of the things um, that often come along with these, um, these issues. Okay. Da, 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 da. Let's talk about muscle pain and fatigue. All right. So I was talking earlier about um, passive support of connective tissue. So let's kind of go back to that. If we're thinking about the actual like physical stability, what holds a body together, what holds a body up in certain positions, we've got passive support structures and we've got active support structures. Now, passive support structures are things like our bones. We don't have to contract those. They're just there for us. Yay. Thank you, bones. And then we've got other tissues like those collagenous connective tissues, the joint capsules that are like holding, you know, the joint together, our ligaments are holding bones together, our fascia that is throughout everywhere. It's transmitting force across joints. It's doing amazing things. So we've got all these passive structures. Well, when we have decreased stability from those collagenous connective tissues, we have to rely more on our active supports. What are active supports in a human body? They are muscles. Muscles are our active supports. We can actively contract them to hold our body in certain positions. And so that's what's going on for someone with hypermobility at baseline, in the background, all the time, is we've, we're getting a lot of compensation from our muscular system that's stepping up, contracting a lot more to give us some stability in the context of having decreased stability from passive structures. Part of what's going on in the connective tissue of a bendy person is um, quicker connective tissue creep and slower recoil. And so I'll unpack what that means just a little bit in case you've never heard these terms. So um, it, connective tissue like joint capsules, fascia, ligaments, all that, um, it's made largely of collagen. When you pull on it, tension, you pull on it like a stretch, like a yin yoga thing. You know, you're, you're kind of like letting that stretch, you hang out there for a long time and you let it impact your connective tissue. Um, connective tissue responds to tensile loading, i.e. stretching, in a viscoelastic way. It becomes more viscous the longer you stay there. So it's time sensitive. It's also temperature sensitive. But um, that when you tug on it for a while, a few minutes, it starts to spread. It changes shape. That's called tissue creep. It creeps. It creeps. And in a bendy body, the connective tissue does that more quickly. It does that more easily. It's just easier to change its shape. It's just not as taut. Okay. And then after you remove the stretch, from standard issue connective tissue, it comes back. It recoils back to its resting length. And in a bendy person, it does that more slowly. Okay, so we have easier deformation, we have slower recoil. And that is just one component of what it means to have less passive stability in our, um, in our structure. So when we have the muscular system stepping up to say, okay, I'm here, I'm gonna help out. I'm gonna work double time to provide some stability for you body, because um, I see that you need it. We get chronic muscle contraction. We get fatigue, um, bendy people's muscles fatigue more easily. And at baseline, they actually don't have the um, endurance or strength that non-bendy people have. We have to work harder at that to maintain muscle strength. But we get a lot of muscle fatigue, crankiness, tension, like the feeling of tension, which is muscle contraction. And when muscles are chronically contracted, they also don't get great blood flow. And in the situation where muscles don't get great blood flow, they can become more chemically irritable, okay? They become more acidic. And um, that just sort of is another contributor to discomfort. Okay, so that's a lot of this like perfect storm for bendy people to have muscle pain and fatigue. A lot of reasons for it. Let's talk now about the autonomic dysfunction that I mentioned. So the autonomic nervous system is a component of 
um, your um, nervous system. <laughs> <laughs> obviously but um we have part of our nervous system that we're more in control of the somatic nervous system that controls our movements and stuff and then on the autonomic side we're not as in control of these these autonomic nervous system controls automatic functions like your breathing your heart rate your blood pressure that type of thing and we've got a couple different um components of that but basically dysautonomia is a word that means this part of your nervous system is supposed to just work it doesn't work as well. It has a harder time regulating those automatic functions like your heart rate and your blood pressure. And there are some different reasons for that. But um, bendy people often have low blood pressure and low blood volume. And part of that has to do with the fact that collagen, the floppy collagen we have, also makes up our blood vessels. And so what tends to happen, especially when we're standing, is that blood pools in our lower body thanks to our saggy vessels. I mean, if you just think the theme of a bendy person's kind of tissues is sag, sagginess. It's not a character flaw. I've got the saggy tissues too, but it's just, you can, it kind of helps us imagine what's happening in a body. It's just like some sag. So we've got um, saggy vessels where when we stand up, the blood's now going to just pool and kind of sag in the lower body. Well, we still have to get blood flow to the noggin, even if we're upright. So what has to happen? Our heart rate has to get cranked up a couple notches. And so we get a lot of faster heart beating, just try to get this blood pumping um, out of the lower body. And that just is uncomfortable for a lot of people. This whole sort of scenario of uh, dysautonomia, it, it makes people dizzy a lot. It makes it hard to be upright, sitting for prolonged periods and certainly standing. It can actually be, um, not possible for people with severe cases of dysautonomia. They can't stand at all or they pass out and all kinds of things. Okay, so we have a, a real wide range, of course, of severity of these kinds of challenges. But many people have what's called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's what I just described to you. We stand up, we get the heart rate goes crazy, we get dizziness, we get brain fog, anxiety, because that heart rate, what makes that go? Oh, sympathetic arousal, right? I mentioned that our autonomic nervous system has a couple components. One component is the sympathetic component. That's like the fight or flight stress response. It's like mobilizing energy. Um, that's what gets our heart rate going fast. Well, that's also consistent with feelings of anxiety, uh, which is a, a really common challenge for people with hypermobility. All right, so all that stuff is going on in part thanks to um, the difficulty we have being upright. It's called orthostatic intolerance. So next time, you know, if any of you are bendy people and you have this experience, I did my whole life, I never understood it. I would just kind of like, I just could not stand uh, being upright. It was just hard. It's very taxing on the system. So you can now call that orthostatic intolerance and it's very fancy, okay? So this is um, another reason why we can use all the help we can get when it comes to sustained postures in gravity. It is harder for this system on a physiological level to be upright. And as we saw before, it's also harder for this system from a musculoskeletal standpoint to be upright because our muscles are tired and they're working hard. So I just want to paint that picture as to this is all stuff that is why posture matters to bendy people. I hope that is making some sense to you. And um, certainly, uh, Rebecca, you're asking, would it make sense that standing still is harder than walking? Absolutely. Okay, so like <laughs> the side note to this whole conversation is the best thing you can probably do is like keep moving. Just keep moving. Um, human bodies don't love sustained postures anyway. Like human bodies like movement. They like a variety of movements. So that's kind of what this whole organism is adapted for. And um, when it comes to the issues facing people with hypermobility, that's more really magnified. Like, wow, this body is going to be much happier if it's moving. Okay, so we're talking about sustained postures today, but in the end, 
you'll do better the, the less you sustain postures, <laughs> the more you move. Okay. And if you're at a, a certain job that has you being in a sustained upright posture, say all day, you'll do better the more you take breaks and move around and go for walks and keep kind of help your system maintain blood flow and all that, or take breaks to lie down, give it a rest, that type of thing. Okay, so if we can learn to um, optimize how a bendy body handles gravity, how can we stack our parts in gravity um, to optimize our you know, muscle function? How can we learn to decrease pain and fatigue, ideally for our muscles, increase our stability from passive structures, i.e. bones, um, increase our comfort, ideally, and increase our awareness so we can, you know, what we practice here today or in our yoga practice, we can translate to our job and things like that so that we've got more awareness more of the time and we can learn how to better take care of this unique system of a hypermobile body. All right, so I have one main cue for posture, just like broad brush stroke. What do I say about posture? Back it up and stack it up is what I say about posture. Back it up and stack it up. And we'll go through both of those things and what I mean by that. Okay, now I'm gonna make some generalizations about postural habits. They are generalizations. They're not accurate for everyone, but you know, it's the best I can do. I'm gonna paint just a broad picture here. But what I'm describing may not describe you accurately or you know some other people that you know. That's just the way it is. But what I can say is that many bendy people tend to collapse into gravity for all those reasons we just discussed. It is exhausting to be upright. Um, and so they just like, oh, they just collapse. And one way that collapse happens, the way it happens for me is in this picture. This is me in this picture, and I'm exaggerating it, but very often the center of mass, which is your pelvis, um, will just burp, be shifted forward. Okay, so here's my pelvis in this picture. And it's just, it's shifted forward in space, like so that the center of mass, if I were to track where is it landing, it's landing over my toes rather than my heels. You can see that forward shift. That forward shift of the pelvis is one way a body can kind of collapse into gravity. It's a common um, pattern I see in bendy people. Again, it's not always going to happen, but, but let's say it does. When it does, it changes the entire geometry of the whole body. It changes pelvic position, it changes the rib cage position, the shape of your spine, the position of your shoulders, the position of your head and neck, it puts more strain on the patella and the forefoot. The center of mass is now over the front of your foot rather than over your big sturdy heel bone, it's over your toe bones. And um, that could be significant in a number of different ways. So what I mean by back it up is I mean, notice your center of mass, i.e. your pelvis, where is it? If it's forward, back it up, bring it back, weight into the heels, bring the, sh shift the weight back into your heels. How much? Well, so that your toes are a little bit free to wiggle. If we're talking about standing posture, I want free wiggly toes. Um, and that just requires that I back it up. Okay, so that's step one, back it up. And in a moment, um, when I get through all these, we can kind of practice this together if we have time. And you feel free to be standing up in your room and, and practicing it right now. That's great. And then part two is stack it up. All right. So we're, now we're going to stack our bones. And sometimes it's awkward to stack your bones in ways that they don't normally stack. And that's okay. And it's effortful at first. But if we can build some habits over time, um, then we might be a little bit more um, apt to sort of drop in to more bony support more of the time and hopefully find more ease there. So how do we stack bones? Well, we've already shifted our weight so that the pelvis is back over the heels. The heel is a nice sturdy weight bearing bone. Uh, and now we've got our tibia, the shin bone, sitting on top of the heel bone, calcaneus. And then we got our femur bone stacked on top of that. We got our pelvis on top of that, ribs on top of that. Spine is shaped by the, the the relationship of our pelvis and our rib cage. Once we get that situated and we can extend our upper back, our shoulder blades just kind of fall into, into place. I don't have to squeeze them all the time. 
they're just following my rib cage. The rib cage is simply following my spine and my head sits on top of the spine. All right, so that's the stack it up and we'll break that down into bits and practice that momentarily. But um, hopefully you can just see that geometry in the picture, just the stacking of bones. Okay, um, let's move on here and let's get into this different pieces here. So in that list, I said neutral-ish pelvis. We gotta unpack that because there's a lot of talk out there in the world about what you should be doing with your pelvis all the time, right? In posture, especially. Tuck your tailbone, don't tuck your tailbone. Blah, blah, blah. Neutral pelvis. Ooh, what does all that mean? Ooh, it's hard to know. So it depends on who you ask, but since you're here, you're asking me, and I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Neutral pelvis is a really nice concept. It's a really nice thing we can practice that can help us build a foundation for our sustained postures. I'll go ahead and tell you that the pelvic position and the rib cage position in my mind are the most important things about posture. When we can get that relationship set up, optimized, everything else is going to have an easier time falling into place. So I'm holding a pelvis in that picture. I'm holding a pelvis here. Good news is you have a pelvis. And so I'm going to describe some bony landmarks of a pelvis and you can feel yours to know where your pelvis hangs out. Okay, so let's locate these bony landmarks. The ASIS, here are the top pointy, front pointy um, bones, part of your ilium. It's called the anterior superior iliac spine. So that's the ASIS. Um, and sometimes people call those your hip points or the headlights. So find those with your thumbs, like I'm doing in that picture. And then the pubic bone here right? The pubic bone under, underneath your belly, just south of your belly. And you want to see if you can get your hands on your bony pelvis here so you can feel the position of it. Now, a neutral ish, I say ish because eh, we don't need to get out a ruler, but let's just get a sense. And all of our bony landmarks are a little bit differently shaped. So we're not, this isn't an exact science. Okay. This is really just a guideline. So always go for ish. Now, when you can line up the ASIS and the pubic bone in a vertical plane with each other, that's neutral-ish. Okay, that's my best rule of thumb for you. And um, if you were to pour the bowl of the pelvis out the front like that, sticking your tailbone way out behind you, that's considered an anterior tilt of the pelvis. And if you were to tuck your tailbone under, that's considered a posterior tilt of the pelvis. So go ahead and wiggle your pelvis back and forth, stick your butt out, tuck it under, and just kind of feel how the bones move. And you can start to shift your pelvis, whether you're sitting or standing, into a neutral-ish way of being, okay? If you're sitting, you'll probably need to be elevated. It's very hard to sit on the floor with your legs crossed with a neutral pelvis. Your pelvis is gonna go posterior unless you're a, a rare human and you might be. But for most people, we need to sit up on something, a bolster or some blankets to let the pelvis drop into a more neutral place. What's interesting about that shifting forward is, and you can play with this standing as well, find your bony landmarks, stand up, shift your weight forward into your toes. And when you do that, most pelvises are gonna tip posteriorly. So there, that, that weight shift automatically changes the tilt of your pelvis. So when we back it up, back the pelvis up, our pelvic tilt position is gonna change. And often it falls more into a, a neutral place on its own once we get our weight shift back. All right, so that's pelvic position. That's the neutral-ish. Now we need to stack the rib cage on top of the pelvis. I love this picture, this drawing of posture, because if you can see my mouse, uh, I'm not sure you can, but I'm drawing a line through this person's trunk, rib cage. And you can see that their rib cage is like this. And when we stack the rib cage over the pelvis, the rib cage is going to be like this instead, right? So you can see that this person's lower ribs are really jutting forward a lot. And so I'm going to ask that person to just drop the ribs down in the front to stack over the pelvis. You can just feel your low ribs, bring them down to stack over that neutral pelvis. That does a couple things. 
that will restore a moderate lumbar curve, which is way down low in the, in the lumbar spine. That's where we want the lumbar curve. And it also sets us up for optimal deep core muscle stability. So this is another reason why neutral-ish positioning of the body can be helpful. It's helpful for neuromuscular function, like when the pelvis and the rib cage get stacked on each other, the respiratory diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm, they get connected to each other. They work together. They're part of the same team. They're part of the same kind of deep core team. We're um, in a position where our deep lumbar multifidus, muscul uh, the muscles in the lumbar sacral area that really support our pelvis and low back, they're more likely to be automatically kind of on board, recruited, awake. Okay. Same with our deep abdominal muscles. So we're really setting up a situation here with this relationship to facilitate our deep core muscles functioning as well as they can. Okay. What happens when we stack this rib cage over our pelvis is, hmm, oftentimes all of a sudden we've got this super slouchy posture. And I'm wondering if any of you all are feeling that. You can report back later. But when you stack that, the ribs over the pelvis, it's like all of a sudden you're, you've revealed this kyphosis. All of a sudden you've got this humpback, this big excessive forward rounding of your thoracic spine. And we have to deal with that next. Okay. So when someone sees this slouchy sloucheroo in yoga class, they're like hunched over, you know, they might say, oh dear, that looks so unappealing. I want that to stop. I'm just going to say, can you please lift your chest, lift your chest and oh, there go the ribs. Now I'm upright more, but my ribs have just um, jutted forward a lot. And now I'm back to this guy here, back to here. Right. So it's really hard to kind of be able to see what's happening here. When I drop the low ribs, suddenly I'm, I'm slouched. And if I send my low ribs forward, now I've still got this big curve in my upper back. Um, what, am I, what do I do about that? So what we want to learn to do about that is drop the ribs and then learn how to do this with the spine, learn how to extend it. And that's hard to do. It's really hard to do. Okay. And what I uh, give you some tips about how we can kind of help explore how do we find the thoracic spine extensors, the muscles that actually change the shape of the thoracic spine. Okay. So that's the task of the upper body once we get our pelvis and our ribs stacked. Learn to find the muscles that extend the thoracic spine. If we do that, shoulders fall into place head sits on top of the spine and that's that's really the bulk of our postural work for many of us okay so i've got a couple tips for you if you're scratching your head thinking how the heck am i going to do this grab a yoga strap put it around your rib cage step into it put it over your head whatever uh, loosen it up enough to get it around your low ribs like i have in the picture here don't pull too tightly on it just make it have contact with your body it's all you need a little contact there okay and grab an eye pillow. I've got a special head cushion that I highly recommend. It's um, developed by Esther Gokhale. If you know her work, the Gokhale method, it's a little bit heavier than an eye pillow, but an eye pillow will do if that's what you got. All right, so the strap around the low ribs is helpful for you feeling where your rib cage is. Just awareness, it's just tactile cue. All right, so if you tend to jet your ribs forward, you can breathe into the back ribs, into that strap, and have that help you anchor your ribs over your pelvis. And then if you notice your slouchy sloucheroo, well, the head cushion or the eye pillow on top of your head gives your head a little target. It says, head, push into that, push that pillow up towards the sky without taking your ribs with you. And if you can do that, you have just discovered some thoracic extension, okay? And it's subtle. All right, so you wanna put the, the pillow on your head in a way that if you push up into it, your neck stays long, okay? The back of the neck stays long. Drop your low ribs and push the pillow up towards the sky. Drop your low ribs and push the pillow towards the sky. That's kind of the, those two ends of things will hopefully help you feel some action, some activation of the muscles in your thoracic spine, your upper back, okay? And that's the practice, okay? So it's gonna feel weird and, and hard for a while, possibly, over time. 
um, it'll get more natural and you'll be able to drop into that neutralish pelvis, that foundation for your spine. You'll be able to drop those low ribs. You'll, you'll know the feeling of thoracic extension, you know, the feeling of pressing the crown up towards the sky and it'll become easier, but you have to feel the bony landmarks, feel where your bones are. As a teacher, you need to probably ask your students to feel where their bones are because it's hard to see it. It's hard to just eyeball your students and know what their pelvis is doing. Um, I would recommend that you practice for a few minutes at a time. If it feels tedious, take a break. Just practice a little bit and um, practice both in sitting and in standing. And like I said before, when in doubt, uh, keep moving, right? And you'll probably just be better off um, across the board. Okay, so those are a few tips. Now, um, I'm definitely going to answer some questions. We have some time, but I want to leave you with this and you'll get all this in your follow-up email as well. Ways to find me, um, connect with me. I'd love to hear your thoughts always. And um You'll be you'll have some links in your follow up email to join my email list if you're interested. OK, so I'm going to just stop the share, but to bring up some questions, hopefully, and let's work through some of this posture stuff together. Let's see. So many questions. OK. Tisha, I'm just like, ooh, my eyeballs just landed on yours. Tisha, you're exhausted at the end of the day. Totally. I mean, humans probably are exhausted at the end of their day, but bendy people, whoo, it's so hard to be in a bendy body. It's hard work. It's exhausting in a lot of different ways. So that makes sense. And you, you're saying that you have to concentrate all day to not hyperextend. Yeah, it is hard work. And so what's cool about the... Um, this realization is that hopefully it clues all bendy people into the idea that your best friend from now on forever is going to be strength training, is going to be how can we um, help these muscles be as strong as they need to be to do the work that they have to do. Okay, so that's always going to be my recommendation for all bendy people is that you find someone to help you with strength training. And I'm actually going to launch an online program soon um, to that end partially. But anyway, um, and that you just get that into your self care routine. Um, Doug, you are talking about for you, posture starts with not letting your knees go backwards. Okay, so some awareness of those hyper extending knees. Certainly not an issue if you're sitting, but if you're standing, boom, your knees are going to go backwards and that kicks your pelvis forward. Definitely. That's a great point to bring up and great noticing, Doug. By the way, I'm so glad you're here, Doug. I see you on Facebook a lot and I'm glad that you're here today. So Doug's um, kind of describing this knee hyperextension, when that happens, his pelvis goes forward and that disengages his abdominal muscles and then he slumps over and hang off your spine. Exactly. Doug, since you're here and I think listening to me right this minute, um, did, the, did my description of like the back it up and stack it up make sense to you for some tips about how do you get out of that collapse? Yeah. Good. So it makes sense for you at least. That's great. Okay, Carol Lee, you're saying, can you describe how to drop the ribs again? Yes. So um, the wall can be actually a great tip. Now I've given you the tip of strap around your ribs. Um, let me show you a couple of things actually. So I'm just gonna kind of get up on my knee so you can see my pelvis and my ribs here. Okay, so here's my pelvis. I can find my neutral pelvis, there I am. Then I could bring fingertips to those ASIS Thumbs to my low ribs, if I'm a rib thruster, which by the way, I am, um, this is like the hardest thing I've ever done, I'm gonna be going like this a lot, right? My ribs are forward. So I have to just pull them down with my hand. I'll just pull, push them down. When I push them down, I get all slouchy. You can see that kind of, right? When I push my ribs down, I was here. I've just, okay, so I was here. I've backed it up, stacked it up, and now I'm slouchy. Now I got to get my head cushion on and learn to press my head up towards the sky without taking my ribs with me along for the ride. So it's like, how do you separate thoracic extension from the hinging that really is happening at the lumbothoracic junction? 
with the rib thrust. And it's just practice. So feel, I like to put hands, you know, put your hands on your body, feel your parts and, um, and just kind of practice with it because um, it's hard to do. So Carol Lee, if you're still here, let me know if that was helpful at all. Um, da, 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 da. And Doug, good reporting. Thank you for sharing this. Doug is also saying uh, your awareness of and your mindful kind of correction of your jacked up posture <laughs> and motion mechanics makes a huge difference for you. It does for me too. And so this is, you know, when we go back to all the research out there that, um, really does call into question how much posture matters for the general population. It makes sense to me. I mean, you see out there plenty of people with crazy posture and they actually are fine, you know, but bendy people I think are ones that are going to suffer more with the crazy postures because of their unique characteristics. And even though this way of stacking bones was really hard for me to learn and it takes some effort, um, it makes a huge difference for me too, especially with my um, neck and shoulder tension, the upper trapezius, that when our head hangs off the front of the spine, you know, those muscles have to contract so hard to hold the head up, like reeling in a big fish. And it does cause more discomfort. So, all right. And then Kathy, great question coming in. Does pulling the shoulders back help to stack up? I honestly think an emphasis on scapular position is, um, is overdone a bit and it can mask what's really happening underneath um, in the spine. Okay, so the scapula follows your rib cage. Scapula, shoulder blades sit on the rib cage. They literally follow the contour of your rib cage. And the shape of your rib cage is dependent on the shape of your spine. So for a lot of people, if you can really find that uh, spine position where you can get out of the kyphosis and extend a little bit, you'll find that the rib, the shoulder blades rather, they just kind of like fall back a little bit. They're less forward and, and it's more visually appealing. You know, you, oftentimes people see all the, especially yoga teachers, they'll see shoulders forward any amount and they'll just cue scapular retraction where really we need to dig farther down. We need to dig all the way to the spine. We need to get the, the rib cage and the pelvis relationship settled. Then we can see what's happening with the spine. And when we can address the spine, shoulders are going to fall into place more or less. Okay. Will they totally? Maybe not because we may have uh, some real restrictions, say in the soft tissues of our chest or different things like that, but they'll have a, a better opportunity to just fall where they fall. Uh, and, and anyway, um, I think we can appreciate that normal human shoulders hang off the rib cage a little bit anterior, about 30 degrees anterior. That's the angle of the scapula. So again, I think it's a bit overplayed, honestly, in yoga world. So hopefully that's helpful, Kathy, about just what role are the shoulders playing in, the, in all this. And um, hypermobility is not limited to skinny folks. <laughs> that is the truth, Rebecca. All kinds of shapes of bodies have hypermobility. That's for sure. I <laughs> um, hope I didn't say anything to lead people to think otherwise. Um, and Tisha, you're saying you could hyperextend your back if you pull your shoulders back too far. Yeah, I think, again, shoulders can confuse what's going on in the spine. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to take this question and then I'm going to go back up towards the front of our um, thread here and see what earlier questions people had. Rebecca's asking, are there any passive positions that you would recommend on the floor to help increase thoracic mobility? That's a great question. When we're talking about hypermobility, people who have generalized hypermobility, there are very often little zones of the body that are hypomobile, that are very, very stiff in part as a compensation for all the other instability. One of those places is quite often the thoracic spine. It's like a brick. It just doesn't want to move. And so it can be helpful for many people to try to encourage more thoracic mobility so that the thoracic spine has some ability to get into a, a new position and out of its slouch. What I really like, Rebecca, is just a passive back bend over um, 
like I said, a therapy balls or a foam roller or something where I'm supporting my head and I've, I'm supporting my, I'm keeping my kind of lumbar spine neutral and my neck pretty neutral. And I'm just really focusing on back bending over the roll and I'll do a dynamic, like I'll just go back and forth, back and forth. I also like a lot of twisting, just trunk rotation back and forth on my back um, with my shoulder blades kind of stuck to the ground knees side to side. So rotation often helps get some mobility back in that thoracic spine. Yeah. Um, so um, Tisha is asking about, have I heard anything about researchers finding a gene causing hypermobility? So a lot of conditions, like I mentioned before, feature hypermobility, like for example, Marfan syndrome. It's well understood genetically, not by me, but, you know, out there in the medical world it is. And, um, and it's a genetic alteration of some, some connective tissue fact, you know, component. Same with all the other 13 types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, certain types of collagen, et cetera. With hypermobile type, there is research underway to try to determine a better picture of what's going on genetically here. And we don't know yet, but there are some projects I think they'll be reporting very soon. I know one lab in South Carolina um, that I follow called the Norris Lab at Medical University of South Carolina. They're doing a big genetic study on hypermobile EDS. They have my saliva in their study, one of many, many. And um, they have an article in peer review right now that has some candidate genes or gene, I don't know. But anyway, so that'll be coming out hopefully in the next you know, year or, or two. Um, I am a, a, a Yoga Alliance certified provider. <clears throat> okay. Lizzie, did you yeah. flag any earlier questions from the thread? I'm just going to go back and see if, if there are any there that I can go back to. Yeah, a few uh, more so <laughs> operations. <laughs> so Lindsay did ask if you all were Yoga Alliance certified, basically to ask if this could be counted as a CE. Correct me if I'm wrong, if they, um, you know, go in to their pro, you know, membership and add you as, you know, the hour, that would count, right? Yes, it would for sure. And if you just do that, um, you could call it just the name of the presentation. Yoga Alliance then emails me and I go in and confirm it. So it's really easy. So definitely you can do that and get yourself an hour of continuing education. Yeah. And then one other thing, and you can totally say no, because these are your amazing slides, but if you were willing to share your slides um, so they can view again, we'd love, we'd okay. love it, but if not, totally okay. Okay, I can send, I'll send you, Lizzie, a PDF of the slides, and you can include that in the follow-up email. That's Perfect. fine with me, yeah. Amazing. Um, well, that kind of wraps up our time. I'll go through the questions, and I'll email you some that, you know, came out and we think would be good to answer in that email as well. It's more general. Um, Libby, I wanted to say thank you so much for your time today. And It really looks like our audience here was so into this topic. I found myself, you know, I was off video, but I found myself doing all the posture things. Yeah. And I definitely will, now that I know some of this information, start to incorporate because I'm sitting, you know, at my desk for a long period of time during the day. So yeah. and I'm yeah. sure all of, you know, everyone can relate yeah. to that. Yeah, and you know, one last thing I'll just leave people with is um, don't, you know, get so hard on yourself. You have to be in a certain position. It's really about develop a, developing a relationship between yeah. your, think of it that way and mm. it'll be a little bit more freedom in it for you, I think. So thanks oh, so much for that. having me and thank you everyone who was here. It's great to get mm. so many interested people and all your questions have been great. Yes. And just a reminder, we are giving away one copy of the Libby's new book, Yoga for Bendy People, to one lucky attendee. Um, that will be randomly selected after this, and we will email you directly if you have one. So just keep an eye out in your email in the next couple of hours, um, and you might be selected um, as the winner of our book giveaway. Um, a lot of other information out there, but we will send an email with all of that so you guys can connect with Libby because she's an amazing resource and we're so happy to have, you know, a friendship and a partnership with her. So hopefully we'll have you on another webinar soon, Libby. But for now, thank you for joining everyone and we will see you next time.
Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.